The issue of why is there evil is often referred to in the literature as the problem of evil. Now, if you would just go ahead, and you might as well just leave, if it's possible, tech guys, I don't even know where I'm looking, to just leave the PowerPoint up. Otherwise, I'm going to do the rest of the lecture like this. Because uh, everything on, I'm saying needs to be uh, seen on the, the slides here. So let me catch up with myself. So you guys talk awkwardly among yourselves while I do this. When we talk about the issue of evil, including the problem of evil, or why is there evil, whatever that is, we want to make some distinctions, at least two. In the literature, they distinguish between natural evil and moral evil. Now, whatever else might need to be said about the legitimacy of this distinction, it's incumbent upon us to at least appreciate what the distinction is in the literature, how this discussion has gone on for a number of centuries. So, in effect, what they mean by this distinction when they talk about the problem of evil is that natural evils are things having to do with, you know, tornadoes, tsunamis, baldness, things like that, okay? That is, evils that are not, at the, that are not caused by conscious beings, whereas moral evil in this context would be evils that are caused by conscious beings. So you might think of things like murder, like the Holocaust, or, or, or robberies, or things like that. It's an important distinction to maintain, even if, given enough time, I would want to try to argue that at some point in our metaphysics of understanding evil, and I don't know why I'm doing my hands this way. For some reason, I felt like when I said metaphysics to just, I don't know if that's the hand signal for metaphysics, but at any rate, next time you're somewhere, you do that, maybe they'll know you're talking about metaphysics. There's no telling what my hands will be doing while during the, it, it, you know, may give me another example of evil. But whatever else I might want to say about the metaphysics of evil that would try to blur and remove this distinction, it's important for our purposes here to play off these distinctions and some of the things we're going to say about evil. Now, the problem as it's come down to us, and I'll give you sort of an anatomy of that problem here in due course, but the problem as it's come down to us in Western thought was first formulated by uh, Epicurus. And we have from a secondary source an accounting quoting Epicurus. Here's how he describes the problem of evil. But if in this account, if this account is true, which the Stoics were in no manner able to see, that argument also of Epicurus is done away. God, he says, either wishes to take away evils and is unable or he is able and unwilling, or he is neither willing nor able, or he is both willing and able. If he is willing and is unable, he is feeble, which is not in accordance with the character of God. If he is able and unwilling, he is envious, which is equally at variance with God. If he is neither willing nor able, he is both envious and feeble, and therefore not God. If he is both willing and able, which alone is suitable to God, from what source then are evils, or why does he not remove them? Now, in its modern exemplification, you see this problem probably most articulated by David Hume. In fact, I think 99 times out of 10, as we say in Mississippi, when people think of the problem of evil, they think of David Hume. Now, there are, not only do we need to make a distinction within the notion of evil, but we want to make a distinction in, in, within the notion of problems when we talk about the problem of evil. There's, first of all, the logical problem of evil. In effect, what this had said was that there is some logical problem, formal problem, of postulating the existence of an all-good, all-powerful God and then the presence of evil. That somehow, if you formalize that argument, it would... It would violate some formal rule of logic. The general consensus among professional philosophers, as far as I can tell, is that the logical problem of evil has been dispensed with. And no one really champions that, at least as far as I know. In fact, one of the uh, recent century, uh, 20th century, most prominent atheist philosopher, J.L. Mackey at Oxford, says we can concede that the problem of evil does not, after all, show that the central doctrines of theism are logically inconsistent with one another. Now, he certainly thought there were other aspects 
of the problem, but he was willing to grant that there was no logical problem, didn't violate some formal law of logic. But there are, as I said, other problems. In fact, the one that we'll focus, that we'll focus on for the balance of the afternoon is what some might call the moral or the metaphysical or the philosophical problem of evil. And that's what we're going to talk about in these few minutes together. But for the sake of completion, I do, it is important that you know that there is another aspect of this problem, what we might call the existential or the pastoral problem of evil. And the reason why it's important to be aware that there is a such thing is because very often in the debate over whether or not there's a metaphysical or moral problem of evil, what will happen during the debate is that the rhetoric will start focusing on the pastoral problem. And the problem with that problem is you can't necessarily assuage people's concern about the pastoral issue by dealing with the metaphysical issue. You can't necessarily do that. Or in other words, it would be something like this. You know, you're trying to defend the existence of God and someone raises the specter of evil in the world and then the atheist goes, well, what are you going to say to the 10-year-old girl who's raped by her dad? And the implication is a metaphysical argument and philosophical argument, apologetics is useless if not offensive in that situation. Aha, I got you. That's what the atheist thinks. You just go, no, no, no. You're confusing two dimensions of the problem. I would not, a pastor wouldn't sit down with a 10-year-old, a counselor wouldn't sit down with a 10-year-old to try to uh, help them in that situation of evil in their life by giving them some apologetic. But that's not what they need. They need some kind of pastoral uh, uh, treatment there. All that means is these are two different dimensions. So don't let someone bully you into thinking that because your metaphysical argument doesn't scratch the itches they have about the pastoral problem that somehow your metaphysical addresses to the problem are illicit. It doesn't follow at all because it's mixing two different dimensions of the problem. All right, so let's unpack the problem more specifically. Premise one, if God is all good, omnibenevolent, I just like to say the word omnibenevolent, try to pepper that in your conversation sometime. If God is all good or omnibenevolent, he would prevent evil. If God is all powerful or omnipotent, he could prevent evil. If God knew in advance, this is a kind of a a tweaking I'm doing of the argument for reasons that will become clear later on. If God knew in advance that his creation would fall into sin, because now we're kind of thinking of it more in the context of the Christian uh, message, then he would have either not created in the first place, if he knew what it was all going to uh, fall apart, or he would have taken steps to prevent the occurrence of evil, if he has the power and inclination. There is evil, that is, it seemingly isn't prevented. So the conclusion seems to follow either God is not all good, or God is not all powerful, or both, or God did not know the future, or God does not exist. And of course, the fourth one is almost always the reason why the specter of evil is raised in the first place. At least in my experience, most of the time it comes up in in the literature and in conversations is for a defense of atheism to just say, look, it's a lot easier just to retire this uh, notion that there is a God as you describe as a Christian than to try to reconcile it. So really, it's it's probably one of the strongest arguments there is for atheism. Now, let me suggest some options that people have proffered for solving this problem in light of God. And I want to categorize these into two groups. Options that I think more or less are off limits for the evangelical, the biblical Christian. And then options that I think are within the boundaries of evangelical Christianity. It doesn't mean that every option within the boundaries is an option that every evangelical ought to go for necessarily. I'm just saying I don't see that they're uh, too serious of an inconsistency between them. So, for example, someone could reject God's omnibenevolence and just say that it just isn't the case that God is all good. You would find such an option prevalent perhaps in Greek polytheism because in polytheism you have a lot of good gods and bad gods. And so the evil 
Uh, the earth is explained as a function of the evil that sort of goes on, all the hijinks that goes on between the gods, and it sort of spills out onto the world. So you, you more or less have just pushed that problem up one level and said, well, really where the evil comes from is, is, are these dudes up here. They're the really problem here. Of course, that's not an option for the, for the Christian. Not only does the pantheism not comport with Christianity, but just pushing the problem up to the level of it being at the level of the divine is really a concession to the problem. You also find this problem in some types of Gnosticism, dualistic Gnosticism like Manichaeanism. And, and, and not only did I want to bring this up because I just wanted to see if I could say Manichaeanism at least once during this lecture, but some of you who know your church history will recognize that Manichaeanism was one of the heresies or one of the cultic beliefs that Augustine was associated with earlier in his life before he came to a saving knowledge. Some would reject God's power and say, well, I'll, com I'll agree perhaps that he's good, but I'm going to argue that he doesn't have all power. This would be, for example, the option from William James. You may be more familiar with William James with his varieties of religious experience. But in his A Pluralistic Universe, there's William James there. He says, the line of least resistance then, as it seems to me, both in theology and philosophy, is to accept along with the superhuman consciousness the notion that is not all embracing, the notion, in other words, that there is a God, but either he is finite, uh, but that he is finite either in power or in knowledge or both at once. In a more popular kind of level, popular meaning more proliferated perhaps in our culture, was the uh, writing of Rabbi Harold Kushner in his book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, who was a Jewish rabbi whose son was afflicted with progeria, the aging disease, and he had to watch his child age up into his 80s and 90s and then pass away right before his eyes. And, and uh, Rabbi Kushner, being a conservative Jew, had to somehow reconcile that experience with his belief in God. And he would finally decided that uh, some things were just beyond God's ability to manage. I recognize his, talking about God's, limitations. He is limited in what he can do on, uh, by the laws of nature and by evolution of human nature and human moral freedom. Even God has a hard time keeping chaos in check and limiting the damage that evil can do. And the sort of clarion call of his book is to rally the human race to go, we need to be on God's side. He needs all the help he can get, so to speak. And maybe together, us with God, we can overcome the evil that's in the world and triumph over it once and for all. Now, I need to say something a little bit about the concept of omnipotence in this context. As we talk about, well, if God is all-powerful, maybe that creates some problems. But so I just wanted to throw this in, really no extra charge for this little theology lesson. But it's important that we realize that the doctrine of omnipotence is not saying that God can just do anything. You can't just conceive of anything uh, and, and conceptually and think, well, if God is omnipotent, then he can do that. Uh, he cannot violate or go against his own nature. I mean, the Bible talks about things that God can't do, like God cannot lie, for example. So this means then, God cannot do that which is logically or metaphysically impossible, which is what going against his nature would mean, or which is morally corrupt, what we would recognize as morally corrupt, which goes against his nature as well. So, you know, can God make a rock too heavy for him to pick up? And, and that our Homer Simpson's version of that was, can Jesus microwave his taco so too hot for him to eat it? That was Homer Simpson's version of, can God make a rock too heavy for him to pick up? How about a rejection of God's knowledge? This is perhaps a, a, a newer uh, modification of the problem of evil, that is at least a response to it. A denial of God's omniscience. You would find this, for example, among process philosophy like Alfred North Whitehead or process theology, uh, Charles Hartshorn. There's Whitehead and Hartshorn. And they basically were trying to argue in, in these very technical, philosophical kind of ways that God was sort of evolving with the creation. And so there are future contingent propositions that God could not possibly know. So he could, it's possible that things happen that he couldn't know would have happened in that situation. So he's exonerated for being responsible for, for these evil. Okay, Whitehead, Hartshorn, these may seem a little uh, distant to us as evangelicals 
uh, in the 21st century. But something I think does hit a little bit closer to home is the controversy that has been raging over the past decade or more uh, about open theism or sometimes called neo-theism, this idea that there are future, uh, future possibilities that God could not possibly know which way it's going to go. Probably the most sophisticated defender or at least explainer of open theism is Gregory Boyd. God often tests people in order to find out what they will decide to do, suggesting that their future actions are maybes, that is maybes in the real sense, maybe to a God, until he, God, tests them. Scripture also frequently depicts God as experiencing regret, disappointment, frustration, and unexpected outcomes, again suggesting that the future is to this extent composed of possibilities rather than certainties, that is, they're not certain in God's mind. It is, I submit, more difficult to conceive of God experiencing such things if the future is exhaustively settled in his mind than if it is in some part composed of possibilities, that is, possibilities in God's mind. Now, in fairness to Hartshorn and uh, perhaps even Whitehand, but Hartshorn more because he was a professing Christian, and to Gregory Boyd, let me just make a few side comments about omniscience. They do claim to hold to God's omniscience. They do claim to hold to that doctrine. But they maintain a different definition of omniscience than the classical definitions of omniscience. Because classically, omniscience would mean that God not only knows what will happen, but God knows what could have happened had things been different. So he knows future contingencies. And he knows things that never will happen. He knows everything. They, however, deny that propositions about the future are knowable. So, in other words, they could say, God knows everything that's knowable. Thus, in their estimation, God is omniscient because God knows everything that can be known, but God does not know the future because it's not knowable. It'd be sort of like me saying to somebody, I believe God is omniscient, but God does not know the name of my sister because I don't have a sister. So, if I don't have a sister, he doesn't know what my sister's name is, right? Well, that seems... But you wouldn't say, well, he doesn't know the name of your sister. Or, How could you be omniscient and not know the name of your sister? You say, well, because that's not something to be known. There's nothing there to know. You don't, you don't have a sister. In a sort of an analogous way, the, the open theist is saying, he's saying... Future statements about the future are not knowable. And so that's how we say God is omniscient but still doesn't know these things. Now, the response to that would require, I think, and has been made uh, a, a cogent philosophical understanding of the nature of future contingencies. If that interests you, then you need therapy, basically. <laughs> and, and I would run to my local physician as fast as possible going, I got interest in future contingencies, what do I do? Here, take this pill. I have an article on my website uh, uh, where I try to exegete uh, Aristotle and a handful of other philosophers about the logical status of uh, future contingency. So if you go to richardghow.com, because in, in this sudden attack of humility, I bought and named a domain after myself. So you can go to richardghow.com and you can enter the site and, and get that article. It's, a, it's, it's basically an exegetical article of De Interpretatione 9 in Aristotle. What about rejecting the reality of evil? Say, it, well, regardless of whether God's omnipotent or omniscient or whatever, what about that, he's, that, he, that there is no evil, really? There is really no problem. Now, you find this in certain New Age religions. Now, I find in some apologetic literature that this accusation is made against Eastern religions. I, I've yet to find, and I'm not an expert in Eastern religions, but I've yet to find an Eastern religion in terms of their sacred literature where they don't acknowledge some modicum of reality to evil. Where I find this sort of uh, marketplace denial of the reality of evil is more the commercialized water down to Eastern religions that you find in America. That's a lot more... Uh, marketable to have a religion that doesn't believe in evil. So, well, who would do such a thing? How about the Course in Miracles? I don't know if you've ever heard of a Course in Miracles. I do a whole course on, not a Course in Miracles. You thought I was going to say a whole course on a Course in Miracles. On the occult, and we talk about these things in detail. What is a, it's basically a book that was supposedly dictated by extraterrestrials to this woman, and she typed out, the, the, and that does mean type out, by the way, so I am justified in using that hand signal. She typed out this manual and, and teacher's guide and things, and this is what the Course in Miracles is. What does it say? 
The escape is brought about by your acceptance of the atonement, which enables you to realize that your errors never really occurred. So atonement just is the recognition that there is no sin. Now, lest you think that we're distant from A Course in Miracles, gee, I've never heard of that. Sounds like Whitehead and Hartshorn as far as I'm concerned. I couldn't tell the difference between them. You can go, for example, in Charlotte, North Carolina, and study A Course in Miracles. In fact, I challenge you, if you're from a fairly uh, modest to larger size metropolitan area, Google A Course in Miracles in your city's name, and I bet you that you will find a reading group somewhere in your community at a public library or at a church where they're studying A Course in Miracles probably this weekend, probably this Sunday. It's happening, this kind of stuff is happening right under our nose. How about the Urantia book? You have your own. I'm like the first person on my block to have my Urantia book. Uh, It's a several thousand page. Again, this was dictated by extraterrestrial beings, and Urantia is the extraterrestrial name for Earth. And so it's this strange sort of amalgam of scientific technology with uh, with, uh, Christian terminology with this sort of uh, watered-down Eastern philosophy all mixed together in this huge tome. And they make a similar kind of statement. Although Jesus did not die his death on the cross to atone for the racial guilt, racial meaning human race, because there are other beings besides humans in the Urantia book, so it's talking about the human race. So although Jesus did not die his death to atone for the racial uh, guilt of mortal man, and then it just goes on to say, but there's still some things we can learn from this historical event. But the point, punchline is, there's not really a sin nature, I mean a sin problem that he had to die for to atone for. Well, voila, there's also a Urantia society going on in Charlotte. And I guarantee you, if you go to a moderate to a larger metropolitan area, Google, we don't have to go there to Google, but if you Google and you're from those areas, you'll probably find a Urantia book going on in your neighborhood. Well, of course, the, the, the point of all of this raising the specter of evil is to uh, defend the notion that maybe God just does not exist. Maybe that's the course of least intellectual resistance. So, for example, you find Theodore Drange, I think he's emeritus professor now at West Virginia University, in his book, Non-Belief and Evil, Two Arguments for the Non-Existence of God. This is just one of uh, virtually countless either whole books or parts of books where the atheist philosopher or atheist apologist is trying to argue against the existence of God by an appeal to the reality of evil. So what can we say about that? Well, we're out of time. No, that's not true. That's not true. That's a joke. So what are the options available for the evangelical? Well, let me say a word about the nature of evil. Since I've said words about some of these other things like omniscience and omnipotence, let me say something about evil. Probably the most enduring, uh, relevant comment and encapsulation about what we mean by evil was given to us by Augustine. And Augustine would, dis- would define his understanding, or he wouldn't, but we define it for him, of how he understands what is evil as a privation. Let me unpack that for you in just a few short minutes. It won't seem short, however, but it will be short. About well, what do we mean by evil being a privation? And you'll see why that's relevant in the overall response to the problem. If God created all things, as the Christian says, and evil is something, I mean, it's a thing, I mean, it's, you know, it seems to be, then God seemingly created evil, which doesn't follow. We don't want to admit God created evil. Well, if God did not create evil, then either evil is unreal, like the Urantia book or Course of Miracles, or evil is not a thing, which means there's a difference between nothing and not being a thing. See, not being a thing is not the same as nothing. Even though etymologically the words not a thing and nothing seem to be the same, there is a distinction to be drawn, and I'll I'll show you an example of that. So Augustine argued that evil is real, but it's not a thing that's created. Rather, it's a privation or a lack in things. Let me illustrate what a privation is. Blindness, for example, is the privation of sight. But blindness in, is not a thing. You can't have, like, how much does blindness weigh? 
what, what is its color, whatever. No, but it's real, isn't it? People really are blind. But it's interesting that a rock cannot see, but we don't call a rock blind. So blindness isn't just merely the inability to see. It's really the inability to see in a thing that ought to be able to see, that ought to be able to see because of the nature of the kind of thing that it is. Well, rocks aren't the kind of things that ought to be able to see. So when a rock doesn't see, it's not a lack in the rock in the, in the, in the fullest sense of the term. It's not supposed to see. It's being what a rock is. It's a good rock if it can't see. But there's something wrong or, if you will, evil, though it may not be moral, but there is, there is some kind of badness or wrongness. Something is wrong for a human being not to be able to see. Why? Because it is of the nature of humans to be able to see. So a something that lacks that is suffering a privation. Now, Aquinas expands upon this quite a bit, and we won't bother to go into his metaphysics, but let me just say enough about it to, uh, to help me along with the balance of what I want to say this afternoon. Evil is a privation of a perfection of a being. It's a privation of its goodness, because in Aquinas... Being is goodness, and goodness is something towards which we all aim to perfect our, our natures as human beings. It is a lack in what a being ought to have or ought to be by virtue of the nature of that thing. So just as a knife is a bad knife if it cannot cut, why? Because knives by their nature are supposed to cut. If this doesn't cut, this is a bad knife. It might be a good spoon, but it's a bad knife. So a human being is a bad human being inasmuch as he does not act in accordance with what a human being ought to be. So moral evil is the lack or failure of a human being to be the kind of person that we as Christians know God created us to be. Now, just as an aside, I must say, I don't think you have to be a Christian to know quite a bit about what it is that a human being ought to be. Because I think the works of the law are written on the heart, Romans 2, 14 and 15. And I think, generally speaking, people know what people ought ought to do and ought not to do. Although that can be sometimes cauterized and it can curdle in our minds what we think is, is good or bad, I think... For the most part, by common grace, we know these things. So acting in such a way that we become what we ought to be is called acting virtuously in the the classical literature in Aristotle and, and Aquinas. So a virtuous character grows out of acting virtuously, and we develop these virtuous habits. Now, with that on the table, let me take the next 15 minutes or so to outline for you what I think are some options that, at least in my estimation, comport with an evangelical view uh, of the world. Even though you might find some evangelicals who will quarrel with some of the technicalities and they may not like the way that I've worded some of these, uh, at least I want to throw these out as some, uh, some working uh, uh, thoughts. Option first, maybe God's plan for the world is inscrutable, what I call the Mr. McBeavy illustration. I don't know how many of you are fans of the Andy Griffith show, but let me take 60 seconds or so to remind you of the Misty McBeavy episode. Because this is one of the early episodes where Opie's real little. And he befriends this gentleman you see him there in the picture who's, a, who's working, he's walking in the trees because he's got spikes on, he's got all these tools hanging around his belt, he's got a silver hard hat on, and he's working like high intensity lines that are entangled, whatever he's doing. And so he comes down out of the tree and he sees Opie, and you know, and so he's playing with Opie, and the, Mr. McBeavy takes his cigarette, and you ever seen somebody blow smoke out of their ears? And you know, he blows smoke in his fist and does that, and it comes out, and Opie's real wide eyed. And what are those hanging? What is that hanging on your belt? Oh, those are my ten extra hands. He's telling Opie about his tools and stuff, and so. He, he, Opie's just so wide-eyed, a little bitty kid. And so he said, well, I, I've got to go home now. It's almost time for something. So I don't want you to go away empty-handed. He said, uh, let me give you a present. And he gives him a hatchet, takes it home, shows his dad. Where'd you get that hatchet? Well, Mr. McBeavy gave it to you. Well, now they think he's, Mr. McBeavy's a m- imaginary friend that Opie has. But he, 
He's like, where'd you get the hatchet? Mr. McBeavy gave it to me. Well, who's Mr. McBeavy? Well, he walks in the trees, has a big silver hat, has 10 extra hands, and smoke comes out of his ears. <laughs> and so they laugh. They think it's cute. But Andy's like, but you need, to, you, know, you need to take that hatchet back to wherever you got it. So he takes it back to Mr. McBeavy the next day and says, my pa told me I can't really have the hatchet. You know, your pa's probably right. It's probably not a good toy for a, too young a child. You could hurt yourself. But I don't want you to go away and hand, Auntie Hand gives him a quarter. Well, the same thing happens. Where'd you get the quarter? Mr. McVeevy gave it to me. Well, who is this Mr. Mc... I'm telling you, he walks in the trees, he has a big silver hat, he has 10 extra hands, and smoke comes out of his ear. And of course, this drags out through the episode, and, 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 and it finally reaches this climactic point where Andy cannot disabuse Opie of his story that there is a Mr. McVeevy. So it finally climaxes where Opie's sent to his room to be punished. Andy comes up there to punish him. Aunt B and Barney are all worried that Opie's going to get a spanking. And he comes up to Opie, and it reaches this emotional apex where he's pressing Opie, I want you to tell me there is no Mr. McBeavy. And Opie says, but there is a Mr. McBeavy, Pa. Don't you believe me? And so Andy has sort of this, this eye-opening moment where he just, he says, yes, son, I do believe you. He goes back downstairs, and then he's trying to explain, what, what did you do? Did you spank him? No. That's good, a good talking to. No, I didn't even do that. Well, what did you tell him? I told him I believed him. Well, Andy, how can you tell, you know, the 10 extra? And Andy goes, are you? and Barney's like, do you mean you tell, you're telling me you believe there's a Mr. McBeavy? You believe in Mr. McBeavy? And Andy goes, no, but I believe in Opie. Now, what I, what I thought was in, in sort of the inverse way, it's like, okay, I'm suspending judgment about, I don't understand this Mr. McBeavy thing. It doesn't square with my worldview, but I know my son enough to know that he's not lying to me, and I trust him about it. If you don't like that, that's because you don't know my son the way I do. End of story. Now, I think there is a legitimate sense in which the Christian can say to the non-Christian, look, I can't really cross every T and dot every I. I don't have everything explained. I can't explain why your son got progeria or why these people survived the tsunami and these didn't. But I know God well enough to trust him, and that's the end of the story. I just can't explain it fully, and I just leave it at that. I think that is completely compatible with the Christian. In fact, I think that is, is really part of this answer. There are things about God that are inscrutable, and he hasn't told us the whole story. Uh, Doug Guyvet, who is a Christian philosopher, said this once, and this just jumped out at me in a debate I heard him do. He said, while it might be easy to imagine what we would do if we had God's power, it is impossible to know what we would do if we had God's knowledge. You could not possibly say, if I knew, if I know what God knows, I wouldn't have sent the tsunami. You couldn't possibly say that. Because you have no idea what you would think if you knew everything God knew. Which is just another way of saying, I'm willing to trust that there are aspects of reality that are beyond my capacity to fully fathom. But I know God well enough that I'm going to trust him with the parts that I don't understand. Probably the most common go-to response to the problem of evil is free will. The notion of free will. Now, I realize that can invite a lot of theological controversy uh, between Calvinists and Arminians, but really the controversy is over what the nature of the free will is, not whether there is free will. Because the Calvinist literature traffics in this same terminology of free will, even if at some theological level they may diverge as to what they think that actually is. So I still feel safe in using the expression free will in a mixed crowd without alienating one or other of the Calvinists and Arminians. That doesn't mean I necessarily comport with Alvin Plantica in every respect and his famous book, God, Freedom, and Evil. But I, I would commend it to your uh, reading as just a uh, resource where he unpacks at a philosophical level some aspects of the, of the notion of freedom. The problem with this response, though, if you can call this a problem, is that given the earlier distinction between natural and moral evil, the free will defense doesn't seem to tell us enough Unless you want to think that every tsunami is at, at the behest of some sentient being like a demon or a Satan, unless you're, which that may not necessarily be a bad thing to do. I'm just saying probably most people wouldn't do that. Unless you're willing to do that, you have then some evils, quote unquote, that you still need to be explained that don't seem to be able to be explained by free will. So how do we do that? 
Well, I like uh, something C.S. Lewis said, what uh, is referred to as the natural orders defense of C.S. Lewis. Let me just give you his quote and then summarize in a few bullet points what I think he's trying to get at. Fixed laws, that is, laws of nature, consequences unfolding by causal necessity, the whole natural order are at once the limits within which our common life is confined and also the sole condition under which any such life is possible. Try to exclude the possibility of suffering, which the order of nature and the existence of free will involve, and you find that you have excluded life itself. In other words, what I think he's getting at is God created human beings with free will. The responsible exercise of free will requires a world of non-capricious physical regularities. But, but these regularities create the possibility of natural evil. In other words, suppose you know, I was going to go up and somebody said, hey, you know, borrow a dollar for you to get a McDonald's coffee. Well, sure. And I get my wallet out and I hand them a dollar. But because the physical laws are just random and just capricious and unpredictable, my dollar turns into a piece of lit dynamite and blows up and kills my friend. Now, Lewis would say, well, look, could I be held responsible for the fact that my dollar bill turned into a stick of dynamite? I think people would go, well, no, you couldn't have possibly known that's what it was going to do. None of us know anything because the laws of nature are just so random that you can't be held responsible for the consequences of any action because you never know what the consequences would be. But if you, if you uh, inject into the scenario a regularity that allows you to know in advance, hey, if you hand somebody a st stick of lit dynamite, they're going to blow up. Well, I didn't know they were going to blow up. Of course you knew that. You know what dynamite is? You know how the laws of nature work? If you inject enough of that regularity that, that then they can know the consequences, and then, then they're responsible for their actions. But then if you have these laws or regularities then as people act freely, it's very possible that you create the problem that people are going to live in a flood zone or people's genetic uh, makeup is going to cause them to have some degenerative disease or they're going to be driving and falling asleep and uh, running a red light and get killed because the laws of nature are just regular. So Lewis is arguing that, that just the regularities themselves create these dangers of, of natural evil. Now let me finish with one last thought on this, at least one last thought that I have for our purposes this afternoon. There's a lot more to be said about this, and a lot has already been said in the literature. But I had a friend um, at, when I was a graduate student in philosophy, and he was one of the most brilliant undergraduate students. Now, I was a doctoral student, but, and, and there were a bunch of, there was about 40 of us in the, in the doctoral program. This is when I was at Marquette before I got kicked out. No, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get kicked out. Could, could we edit that part? Yes, back up. And uh, Matt, my friend, was, he was brilliant. And he, he really struggled with the problem of evil and the existence of God. He read J.P. Moreland and Kai Nielsen's debate, uh, Does God Exist?, which I helped organize when I was a uh, master's student at Ole Miss. And he read that during the Christmas break and came back a theist. But he still struggled with evil. And he said, I don't understand why God would even start all this stuff if he knew it was going to go bad. If he knew people were going to end up in hell, why would he even do it to, in the first place? It seems like if you have God and there's no creation yet, then everything is good. But if he makes a creation and it falls into evil, then you have a net increase in evil. So why didn't he just leave well enough alone? This is what Matt's argument to me was. We hung around together all the time even though I was a Christian and he was a, uh, an atheist or then uh, sort of a modified theist. So I, I struggle with that for, I mean, we're arguing all the time. I'm trying Mr. McBeavy and I'm probably looking for Dick Van Dyke to see if he's got anything for me, any other kind of sitcom and nothing was seemingly was working. And then it occurred to me, I said, well, look, in the consummation of history, this is a Christian view, by the way, that is to say, if I may interrupt myself, this is me interrupting myself, don't let someone bully you into thinking that you've got to give an answer that they find satisfactory, but you can't appeal to other things that you believe are true within your Christian view of the world. They can't amputate part of your Christianity and then say, okay, now explain to me this. I can't. And one of the things I think we have to appeal to 
in people's understanding is the afterlife. There is an afterlife. Now, you might not agree that there's an afterlife. That's fine. You're, you're talking to your, your non-Christian fan. You may not believe that we, that we live after we're dead. That's fine. But I'm telling you, that's what I think is real. And so I have to be allowed to give you the answer I think is the right answer in light of what I think is real. That's fair, isn't it? So I think as a Christian, you could say, well, look, in the consummation of history, when it's all said and done, everything is good. Why? Because all goods will be rewarded. Every good will be rewarded, which is good. But all evils will be punished, which is good. It's good for evil to be punished, just like it's good for good to be rewarded. So if all goods are rewarded and all evils are punished, I'm trying to tell this to Matt, then when everything's over with, everything is good, just like it was before when there was nothing but God. So there isn't a net increase in evil. He was completely underwhelmed by my response. <laughs> but I think that it uh, at least gestures towards an acceptable uh, response to the problem. So what do we know? There's a difference between natural and moral evil. The solution to the problem of evil needs to, be a, needs to address both. Evil should be understood not as a thing in itself, but as a privation of goodness in things. Some uh, some solutions to the problem of evil are incompatible, in my judgment, with evangelical Christianity. But I think there is a rational solution to the problem of evil that is compatible with biblical Christianity and classical theism. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.